couple people online. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the April 2023 edition Houston Sabre. I'm your president, Joe Thompson, I guess. Bill. <laughs> First off, let me apologize to everybody. I can't remember the last time that Bob reminded me of this. Uh, we never schedule a meeting when the Astros are playing at home on a Monday night, usually. Now, the only time we do that is when we go to the ballpark, you know, in August and stuff like that. So, again, let me apologize. Uh, I've already set up meetings for the rest of the year. I promise you it will not happen again. Okay? But for some reason, the Astros seem to think they have to play almost every Monday night this season. Okay? Uh, I don't know why. And they're taking a lot of Thursdays off. It's kind of weird. Um, but this will probably be the only time, well, this will be the only time this happens this season. Um, so that being said, um, welcome to those of you on Zoom. Um, Vincent, hey. Um, Justin, I forget this. Chris, that's right. Chris and Mark and Vince here on twice. What is that? Is that your wife or something? Lena's here. She's uh, she's working on our tech stuff. Hold on one sec. We'll be on only once. I promise you. Are you in Milwaukee or are you back back in Houston? We just got back to Texas. We were up at uh, in Milwaukee for Brewers opening day, though, so it was a, a good a good win. Yeah, I saw him uh, you, uh, on Facebook or something. He had a good picture. Yeah. What were you uh, with your buddies, right? That's Tell right. Me. Yep. <laughs> Longstanding tradition. We've been there like thirty years. We can't miss an opening day. Okay. All right. Good, good. All right. Um, we have two new members for uh, April. Um, Chase Smith from Richards, Texas. And Marlene Vogelsang from San Leandro, California. It's a closet Dodgers fan that uh, knows where the good team is. Despite what's going on right now. Um, we have a couple of, we, we have one guest, I think we have two more guests that just walked in, right? Oh, Jeff, that's right. Oh, see, hey, John. Right. Hello. And your name? Robin. Okay, and you're here with uh, Jeff, yeah. right? And, and John, would you like to introduce your guest? He's a big baseball fan in the uh, fantasy baseball with me for 31 years. He's a practicing attorney for about 40 years. Right, right. Anyway, he's a big baseball fan and he's here tonight to have fun. Okay. Ralph Minkin, right? As Tony said, uh, what'd you say, Tony, when you first met Ralph? Didn't he play for the Cubs or what? <laughs> well welcome all of you um before we get started we have some sad news to pass along uh, i'm gonna let tony talk for a minute uh tony uh new harold jones person right okay so tony if you don't mind uh, he let me know earlier this afternoon about this. So go ahead, Tony. Yeah. Yeah. Harold was a uh, Harold Jones, right? Harold Jones, he, he worked for technical for a long time. He passed away. He was a uh, full eight years of wisdom. He passed away. And uh, he worked for Teneco, and I think Bill May, because Bill was a, a veggie for Exxon. Bill Gilbert. Bill Gilbert. Who yeah. started this chapter yeah. in, the, in the early 80s, right? That's, that's, eight? that's right. With Cal Al Rose was a general manager. Uh huh. And Carol was a great fan. He, he liked to come to the games. And after a while, though, he found the uh, travel. And then they aren't a little too much. But he had a great effort. He was a group here. He's a perfect fellow. Great fan. Very loyal. 
and all the yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So we sent out uh, blessings to Harold's family. Okay. Um, okay. Are we worried about the Astros? Yes. Um, just in case y'all knew or didn't know, um, Ryan McTaggart likes to uh, share these little uh, stats. And in, and in 2020, the Astros record after 16 games was 7-9. 2021, the Astros record after 16 games was 7-9. In 2022, the Astros record after 16 games was 7-9. This year, after 16 games, our record is seven to nine. <laughs> so the point of all that is, who knows? <laughs> all right. What? Have they started selling playoff tickets? I don't know. Uh, does anybody have any concerns? The only thing I'm necessarily worried about is Abreu. He has big shoes to fill defensively. Defensively. And his power bat hasn't shown up yet. Okay. Uh, and I'm really surprised by Justin Verlander 2.0. Hunter Brown. Okay. Uh, if you watched the game last night, um, in between uh, Buster Holney high-fiving because the Astros weren't doing well. Uh, that's what I heard on Twitter. <laughs> but uh, they, uh, the guys uh, – we're talking to Dust, or we're talking about a story about Hunter Brown um, coming in to the dugout when the team was down a little bit and said, "Hey, come on, I mean, it's just we we can get this back." And Dusty just sort of looked at him. He said, "Hey, I see where you're going there." So Hunter Brown, who, who knows? This may be a blessing in disguise uh, with Verlander 2.0. So, all right, center field. Center field. If McCormick uh, vision gets corrected, I guess uh, I don't. I, I, what happened there is something wrong with his vision, right? Yeah, he can't see. He can't really see. That's, I don't know why. Yeah, that's not really good. So, but anybody want to trade for Brian Reynolds yet? Yeah, Pirates. <laughs> <laughs> what? Put you in, coach. Uh, are we okay with the uh, Myers, or does he need to go back to? Okay. All right. I thought the team was short an arm before the season started. Uh huh. And I thought, let's see how Pena does when pitchers adjust to him. Right. So, we'll see. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we shall see. We shall see. Um, speaking of the team, I, I, I like to look at stuff online and I got some injury updates. Uh, Altu Altuve's uh, full forearm cast has been removed, just in case y'all didn't know. He was wearing only a splint on Friday that covered the injured thumb and part of his right hand. Dusty Baker said the removal of the cast was important to prevent Altuve from losing mobility in his forearm. Okay, that was from the 14th. Today, Dusty Baker said Brandley had a good day, taking live batting practice in Florida. He's facing pitchers. Unlike in spring training when coaches were throwing. Okay. McCullers threw the long toss today and his throwing program is going well and ahead of schedule. His next step is mixing in off speed pitches in with mound work before the end of the month. If all goes well, we'll see him in August. We'll see him in August. <laughs> or next year. And we just talked about McCormick. McCormick is about the same and won't be available. Right. Um, for those of you who don't know, we have a 2023 Astros win contest going on right now. Um, the full, we have 38 entries into the contest. 38 of you said, this is how many wins the Astros are going to have. This is how many home runs Jordan is going to have. 
And this is how many stolen bases Tucker is going to have. And we shall see in November 2nd or November 3rd when we're planning for the next World Series parade <laughs> who actually won. But just to give the full list of entries will be in the newsletter, maybe. That's coming out at the end of the uh, in the first week of May. Space permitting. Okay, so I'm hoping the full list of entries will be in space permitting the next newsletter. But just to give y'all, what's that? Huh? The casualty report. Show me the casualty report. Okay. All right. But just to let you know how y'all thought about all of this before the season started. We had 38 entries, and these are the averages. Wins, 96. Jordan home runs, 39. This is the average now. Tucker stolen bases, 33. This would make, if Tucker gets 30 home runs, this would make Tucker the third Astros 30-30 guy uh, in history. Be nice. I, I, I thought, hey, Tucker, you're looking for that money. Why don't you be the Astros first 40-40 guy? So we'll see how that goes. All right. Um, and if uh, the rule changes or any indication, it's going to be a fun year on the, on the base paths, ain't it? Stolen bases are way up. So it should be fun. Um, real quick, last month we had uh, Mike Acosta, Gerald Sanchez here talking about uh, Space Cowboys and what they were doing. So uh, it was a uh, pretty good meeting last month. Um, speaking of the Space Cowboys, uh, we will not have a meeting next month, right? There will not be a chapter meeting. Instead, the chapter will meet at Constellation Field, all right? And we're going to watch on May the 13th, right, Mike? Yeah. Saturday, May the 13th. Get in about 30 minutes before Mike's saying we will have a pregame meeting. We are working on finding a speaker. Yeah. Okay. Get in early, then they're giving away uh, Jeremy Pena jersey. Right. Jeremy Pena jerseys, Saturday, May the 13th. The Space Cowboys versus the El Paso Chihuahuas. Right. It took me some finagling from Pennington. Got him for the whole stadium, Mike. Doing his magic. <laughs> All right. Everybody's getting a jersey in Jersey because of Mike. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> uh, if you have not paid for your tickets, um, it's $55 a person and $3 for every car. Okay. So some of my wording was a little funny, but hey, yeah, I like as a teacher. in the club level up there. Right. Center. So it's nice cream and a buffet. Right. $55 gets uh, that ticket and the buffet. And, and, a, and access to the, the open bar. And access to the open bar. That's right. So if you haven't paid, uh, Mike will take your money tonight. Yeah. If you cannot pay, uh, please send your check to Mike before May 1st. Okay. Uh, if you can't pay tonight. So, um, that's right. Eat in air conditioning. That is true. And if it's warm at all, you can just sit there and watch the game. It should be interesting, depending on who's up and down around May 13th. Yeah, May Fernando Tatis will be done with the rehab. Yeah, Tatis will not be there. Right. So, the Chihuahua. For the Chihuahua. Also, uh, Mike, I, I'm kind of throwing you something here. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, thought about this, but we'd li like to have a chapter day at Minute Maid Park. On the day Bill Brown, our very own Bill Brown, and Bill Dorn gets inducted into the Astros Hall of Fame. August 12th. So we're working on that. There's a couple of people at the Astros Foundation that I am going to ask to speak with us. I'm also going to ask, uh, his name escapes me, but uh, I think it's the chief strategist for the Astros, Jason Barrel. I think that's his name. We try to get him to talk with us in August, and then we'll go to the game that night. It's the Astros and Angels. 
and for August 12th. We're trying to work on that. So, um, so we will not get together next month. That's a Saturday. Yeah, Saturday, August 12th, right. Um, the next time we will meet here will be Monday, June the 12th. All right, I'm getting final confirmation from our uh, speaker for June. <clears throat> There's a couple of people in mind. Um, but if it's the person I'm trying to get, uh, this young woman gave a fascinating talk about why baseball should not depend on analytics as much as it should. It should be a part of the game, but baseball shouldn't tie itself to it as much as it has in the last couple of years, which is fascinating because last night I remember watching uh, watching the game and they said one of the reasons Bruce Bochy stepped away from the game for a while is because he felt like the analytics made it not fun anymore. Okay. And now he's back. Uh, and they said, well, they are not sure why. One of the reasons he came back is maybe it was Dusty Baker's success or something like that. But they specifically said one of the reasons Bruce Bochy stepped away is because he felt like analytics were taking too much part of the game. And, quote, the game wasn't fun anymore. So the presentation in June, I, I, I've heard it already. I heard it in January. You may, I don't think you want to miss it. Okay. For those of you who like analytics or those of you who don't like analytics, um, if Bailey gives the same presentation, I think everybody will be at. Okay. So don't miss it. <laughs> Bailey Hall. She's a young girl. She actually had a teenager. You know, fascinating presentation. So, in school. Um, we already talked about her newsletter. Anybody going to Chicago besides me? Saber 51. Uh, our good friend from Canada, Maxwell Cates, has made reservations for us on Thursday night at Harry Carey's. Okay, so uh, if you want to go, you yeah, can have dinner. Uh, last night I found out my grandson and my daughter-in-law is coming with us. My wife is coming, so I'm going to be happy uh, in Chicago. Um, we're going to make a little side track into Iowa. We're going to get there a little early. I'm going to go see the Quad City River Bandits a couple of days before. Get me a Jeremy Pena bobblehead. You know, Jimmy's trying to talk me into going to fill the dreams, too, but I don't know how much time I have. But the next day, I'm going to Wrigley. So <laughs> that's important. So uh, these are things that I'm planning to do. Hey, I would love it if y'all come up there with us. All right. We're going to a White Sox game that Friday during the convention. So if you want to see the Cubs, you have to be there before that Sunday, July the 2nd. Okay. Otherwise, they're leaving. So if you want to see uh, Wrigley, you need to get there before. Um, full registration is $299 for Sabre members. Three sixty nine for non members. That's all inclusive. That includes a game ticket, uh, ticket to all the uh, events, uh, awards, luncheon, welcome reception, um, stuff like that. It, it's great if you've never been to a national convention. Um, it, it's it's really a fun time. So, besides this chance to go to Chicago. So, all right, Justin. Yes, is our speaker tonight. Those of you who are fascinated by 19th century baseball, hold on. He's going to give a great presentation. How do I know that? Because the subject of his presentation is also the subject of his book. And I don't have a copy of the book with me. I think it's in my car. Um, but the name of the book is called, I'm sure Justin has a copy. Uh, Baseball's Union Association, The Short Strange Life of a 19th Century Major League. It, this book was recently awarded the 2023 Sabre Baseball Research Award. These awards were announced just earlier last week. All right? Yes. Uh, so we got an award winner right here giving us a presentation. Um, yeah. uh, Justin has written articles on 19th century and early 20th century baseball for the Sabre Research Journal. Baseball Journal of the Entry Game, Journal of the Early Game, and the Saber Bio Project. Without further ado, everybody, Justin McKinney. Okay, and Justin, where are you from? Uh, I'm in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, right now. So, yeah. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Um, 
I'll get started here. I'm going to share my screen and then um, we'll get going. So just give me one moment here. All right, so yeah, we'll be talking about uh, the Union Association and its brief existence in the mid 1880s. Um, so to get started, it's worth talking about the context of what was going on in baseball at the time. Um, 1882 had seen the American Association formed as kind of the first ever rival to the National League as a major league that would compete with um, the National League, which had formed in 1876, as you all know. Um, and after that season, which was relatively peaceful, um, both leagues started to engage in a bidding war for players. So players were signing contracts with teams across both leagues and jumping back and forth. And um, this situation wasn't tenable because it meant salaries were increasing and it also meant you didn't know if a player would it would uh, keep the contract or break the contract and it management and the owners saw this as an issue. And so soon a peace was brokered between the AA and the NL, as well as the Northwestern League. And they signed what was called the tripartite agreement, which is also known as a national agreement. And it basically put in place a 10 player reserve rule. So teams could reserve 10 players on the roster for the coming season. Um, and those players, if they signed a contract, great, they're with the team. If they didn't sign a contract, the rights were still held by those teams. And so they couldn't jump to another team that was within the tripartite agreement. And if they did want to break the contract or jump the reserve rule, it would potentially risk blacklist uh, for those players. And so each club in those leagues could preserve up to 10 players. And this agreement sort of ensured peace for the 1883 season, which proved to be the most successful season to date um, in terms of pop baseball's popularity. It was kind of booming. Um, the Philadelphia Athletics, they won the pennant in the American Association, and they set an attendance record with some 200,000 fans across about 50 home games, which is exceptional for the time. And in the midst of this booming season uh, in September of 1883, the Union Association announced um, its intentions to take the field in 1884. Um, so they're planning to put an eight-team league together. Um, and the most notable thing about this league from the perspective of the establishment was that it would they would ignore the reserve rule, which meant they would go after players who had been reserved. Um, they initially stated they wouldn't go after players who had a contract, but anyone who was reserved and had not signed a contract, they were was considered for a game. Uh, and they also intended to put clubs in cities in the that already had clubs in the AA and the NL. Um, and so they're going to put teams in in Philadelphia and Boston and the like. And it was formed by a guy Kurt Al Pratt, who had managed the Pittsburgh Allegheny Club, which is known today as the Pittsburgh Pirates, so he's actually the person who created the club. Um, but he had managed the club in the American Association, but he'd been fired midway through 1883. And uh, Washington Nationals owner Henry B. Bennett became the league's first president at the their first meeting in September of 1883. And on the left, there's a photo of a woodcut of Al Pratt as he appeared about a week before uh, now the league was formed. And then uh, Bennett, um, who is pictured in 1865 as a young man. And so the result of this um, union association and baseball boom was that um, baseball was bigger than it ever had been. Uh, 1883 saw seven fully professional leagues. There were 48 teams, including 16 major league clubs. Uh, and the formation of the union association set off a domino of expansion at both the major league level and the minor league level for the coming season. So the Union Association formed, which meant eight new teams. The American Association expanded from eight teams to 12 teams in order to combat the Union Association. So they put teams in cities where the Union Association was looking for to put a team and to try to freeze them out. And in the case of Washington, they actually put a club uh, in Washington specifically to rival the Union Association. Uh, the Eastern League also formed as an eight-team league uh, of with clubs on the East Coast, and the Northwestern League expanded from eight teams to 12 teams, and then a number of other minor leagues formed across the, the country and also into Canada. And at this point, um, the Union Association is still kind of an idea more than a reality. Um, it, there's, it's not clear where the money is going to come from, but that, that, all, that all changes in late October. Um, Henry Lucas, who was a 26-year-old millionaire, um, his father was a railroad magnate, and he had inherited $2 million in actual 1880 green money. Uh, he was from St. Louis and he officially joined the league with plans to put a club in his hometown of St. Louis. And his entrance kind of shifted 
the league from an idea and a concept to a full-fledged reality because he had the money to to make it happen. And he became the league's dominant figure and was quickly elected president. And if you've read anything about the league um, in your own research, his name is front and center to, to how it came to be and uh, its entire existence is defined in large part by Lucas's involvement. And he made a huge splash by targeting established and reserved major league stars. And this included Fred Dunlap, who at the time was the best second baseman in baseball, uh, Ogredo Schaefer, who was a hard hitting outfielder who had um, started for, uh, in the National Association and the National League for many years, and Dave Rowe, who was a talented young player in the American Association. And then um, the result was this sort of really ticked off the establishment and it kicked off a tumultuous war that basically put the Union Association in opposition to virtually every league and team in the country. And there's Lucas as he appeared kind of as an older man in the early 1900s. Um, but at this point, he's a 26 year old uh, young man. And uh, there's a photo on the left of Dave Rowe as he appeared in 1884. Um, he's wearing the uniform of the St. Louis Unions, which was Lucas's club at the Union Association. Uh, it's one of the few known photos of a player in Union Association uniform. And then Fred Dunlap as he appeared in 1887 on uh, uh, Old Judge uh, Tobacco Code. And so in regards to um, salaries, you might be wondering how much guys were getting paid at this point in time. So salaries in the Union Association ranged from under $1,000 for a year. So the season lasted six months. So the terms of the contracts were typically um, six month season, you get paid, you know, say 200 bucks a month, which meant $1,200 on the season. That was kind of the average salary for a lot of clubs, um, but some teams paid less. And in the case of Lucas and St. Louis, his club paid more. Um, on the whole, the the salary list for each club in the Union Association were lower than both the National League and the American Association. I believe only St. Louis and I think Milwaukee, which joined later in the season, um, were the only two clubs that sort of had salaries that rivaled um, even the lower tier clubs in the in the established major leagues. Uh, the highest paid players were Fred Dunlap, Charlie Sweeney, who was a tumultuous and tempestuous pitcher, Jim McCormick, who was a, a workhorse pitcher who frequently picks, pitched 600 innings a year, Jack Glasscock, who was maybe the best shortstop who's not in the Hall of Fame, and then Hugh uh, Warner M. Daly, who was a hard-throwing pitcher who had lost his left hand in a childhood accident, um, but he had won over 20 games in 1883 and pitched a no-hitter. Uh, and all those guys were making over $3,000 a year um, uh, prorated as well, Like because Sweetie and McCormick and Glasscock all joined midway through the season, so those salaries would have equaled well over $3,000 for the year. And then, uh, so as a result, St. Louis, Cincinnati, Milwaukee had the highest salaries, Altoona, Washington, and Kansas City paid the lowest salaries. Um, so you just get a range of what players were making. And one of the things that becomes central and foundational to understanding the Union Association is uh, that each team sort of took a different approach to a roster construction, finding players, how much they're going to pay for players. And the result was a massive competitive imbalance between the teams. And so I'll just run through sort of how each of the original eight teams in the league were made up. So Altoona, a Pennsylvania club, they um, were a minor league club in 1883, and they had formed to be a minor league club in 1884, um, and they signed players at salaries under $1,000 or up to $1,000, um, and only one player on the roster had major league experience. Uh, Baltimore and Chicago were owned by one person, a man named Albert H. Henderson, and he it was basically syndicate ownership where he signed a pool of players and split them between two clubs. He went after mostly Northwestern League players because they came cheaper than the major league stars, but were also probably the best players in baseball outside of the two major leagues. Uh, and Hugh Daly was his only big acquisition in terms of major league star. Um, the Boston Unions, they signed a mix of aged and problematic Boston legends. Um, and local young players from the Sandlot. So Tommy Bond, who had been probably the best pitcher of the late 1870s, um, he pitched about 4,000 innings by the age of 24, and his arm was basically dead, so he hadn't pitched regularly since 1880. They signed him for very cheap uh, to be their ace. And Tommy McCarthy, who to date is the only Union Association player in the Hall of Fame, they signed him off the, the Boston Sandlots. Uh, the Cincinnati Unions, they had a few players who were regulars in the major leagues the previous season, and they filled that in with a mix of Midwestern talent. Uh, the Philadelphia Keystones took a similar approach to Boston. They signed a bunch of aged Philadelphia legends who had started in the National Association way back in 1871 and such, uh, and a few local youngsters, including Jack Clement, who uh, became one of the best catchers in baseball in the 1890s and still holds the season single season batting record for batting average with the 394 average by a catcher. He's also a left-handed catcher, 
if you're interested in that. Um, and then St. Louis Unions undoubtedly had the strongest roster in the league. They had multiple established struggles in their prime. And um, the opening day roster had seven players who were major league regulars the season before. And the Washington Nationals were formed mostly of local players. And the 1883 club was a semi-pro club. Um, and they only had a couple players with major league experience. And you see there's a range. There's teams that have starters. There's teams that have semi-pros. And it's not the greatest mix. But here's a woodcut of the St. Louis unions as they appeared in just before opening day in April of 1883. Um, it's, I think, a very nice image. It just shows the starting lineup. And here's uh, the Boston Union since he appeared probably in April or early May of 1884. And it's one of the only known, it's one of only two team photos of a Union Association club. And it's only one where the players are in uniform. And then here's the Washington Nationals as he appeared in August of 1884, um, all suited up and looking very uh, classy and professional. Um, but I just want to show these photos because there's just so little photographic evidence of the Union Association. So I was, I'm just happy to have these in my collection. And so as we discussed, the competitive balance was a huge issue for the league. Um, and this is shown no more, uh, it's no more evident than in the case of St. Louis, um, where they started the season 20 and 0. And if you've been following uh, Tampa Bay, they started the season 13 and 0, which ties up a modern record. But you might have heard that the St. Louis Maroons would get, or the St. Louis Unions, as they're more commonly called, will you know, still hold the record at 20 and 0. Um, but it's somewhat tainted in the fact that um, eight of their wins were over the pathetic Altoona Club. So they won eight in a row. Um, over that Altoona, it, it scored them by some something like 94 to 19. Uh, and it was just, yeah, they're, they're, it's a bit of a dubious record, uh, if you ask me. Um, but St. Louis was the best club in the league. And then Washington and Philadelphia were also some of the weaker links along with Altoona. And St. Louis, Cincinnati, Baltimore, and Boston were the class of the league and finished in the first division. And so you just see that there's sort of haves and have nots. And the result of this is that uh, teams proved not to be especially sustainable. And so the first casualty happened at the end of May. Um, Altoona was one of the worst clubs on the field, but they were also um, underachieving at the gate um, because, you know, people in Altoona didn't want to go see, you know, the club get their brains beaten by, uh, by more talented clubs. And so they lost, they were losing money despite having the lowest salary list in the league. And so on May 31st, which was just six weeks into the season, they played the last game and disbanded. They f finished the season with a six and 17 record. Uh, and Lucas had the opportunity to, to bail them out and keep them afloat for the coming rest of the season, but he decided not to because there was little chance the team would be competitive and there was little chance it would cover their debts. Um, they would cover their expenses and you'd just be a money sink basically. And so that puts the league down to seven teams, which meant that they would also soon have to find a, another team to complete the season. And here's a photo of the 1883 Altoona club, which is a minor league club, but it features a number of the same players. I don't know if the uniforms would be similar for 1884 though, uh, but I'd like this photo as well. And yeah, this Altoona's collapse sort of brought forth, you know, series of, tumultuous changes over the coming months over the, throughout the summer of the season. Uh, Kansas City was quickly selected to replace Altoona. They actually formed the club from scratch. Uh, and so within 10 days, they debuted on the field. So they went from not existing to being a fully fledged major league club in about 10 days. And it's Kansas City's first professional club and also the Kansas City's first major league club. Uh, and they they played throughout the season, um, even though they were not a very good club, but they uh, were proved very popular uh, in uh, Kansas City. Uh, the Philadelphia Keystones were the next club to drop. They disbanded on August 8th, so about four months into the season. They had lost $10,000, and they were 21-46. and 46, And they were soon replaced by the Eastern League champion Wilmington Delaware Club, which had gone 51-12 and 12 in the Eastern League. But they uh, joined the, the Union Association and went 2-16. and 16. And so it gives you a sense of what league quality was like. There was a huge discrepancy even between the Union Association, which was the weakest major league, and uh, uh, one of the stronger minor league club minor leagues uh, in in baseball and yet yeah there was this huge discrepancy there and finally the chicago club they struggled at home they were often drawing attendance under 300 fans a game and so they moved to pittsburgh in late august um but because they were owned by the same person who owned the baltimore club uh they eventually merged the two clubs in mid-september and so that created another two openings uh for the union association to complete the season and on the left there is a photo of a, a ted sullivan who is a very influential figure in 19th century baseball. He started 
teams and leagues all over the country and uh, was influential in developing baseball in Texas as well. Uh, but he took over ownership. He started the season as the manager of the St. Louis Unions uh, and he went 29 and four uh, before he quit the team in a dispute with his uh, top players. And so he quickly joined up with the Kansas City Club, took ownership, bought into the club and and became one of the, one of the owners and uh, took, helped the club turn a profit, even if the club was terrible on the field. And Albert H. Henderson, and uh, who late in his life, and he's a very influential figure in the Union Association and in Baltimore baseball history, but has kind of been forgotten. But yeah, he was he helped keep the league afloat as well with his uh, wealth. Um, despite these failures, there were some successes. Uh, St. Louis dominated the league. They turned a profit. They had excellent attendance, and that rivaled the St. Louis Brown Stockings, which uh, today is known as St. Louis Cardinals, um, and they were one of the premier clubs in baseball. And so the fact that Henry Lucas and his club could do battle with them uh, for the fans' attention and come out uh, reasonably well was a, was a big positive. The Washington Nationals were pretty bad on the field, but uh, the club in the American Association in the nation's capital was so poor that they lost the battle for fans and they disbanded in August. And so Washington Nationals actually beat out the American Association. Um, and they built a strong following and they drew very well. They they were drawing 2,500 fans a game, uh, with, which combined with the low salaries made them among the most profitable teams in, in the league. And Kansas City, as I mentioned before, they drew large crowds. They, played Sunday baseball, which was still uncommon at the time. And they often drew 8,000 fans a game and they paid low salaries. And those fans were famously raucous and were known to shoot guns in the, during, uh, to celebrate uh, good plays and to intimidate umpires and opposing teams. Uh, but you can find some funny actors about them just firing off guns and living up to the cowboy reputation. Uh, and finally, um, so with those two spots open in mid-September, uh, Union Association needed to find two more clubs to take the field uh, to complete the schedule. Um, the Northwestern League, which was probably the best league in the country outside of uh, the two established major leagues in the Union Association, it was basically on the verge of collapse by mid-September as well. Um, and so Milwaukee and St. Paul uh, were two of the existing clubs, and they made the agreement to join the Union Association. Uh, Milwaukee had the fortune of signing up to play a schedule that would include only home games, which meant they they had no expenses, basically um, just take it all the tick sales. And, and they did quite well with attendance wise and made, made a good profit because they didn't have to pay anything out um, other than player salaries. And uh, St. Paul made the agreement to play only on the road, which was kind of a, not a great business decision in the sense that um, the way it worked in 1884 in the Union Association is the visiting team would receive $75 as a guarantee from the home club uh, to ensure that they played the game. But this amount wasn't enough to cover player salaries or expenses on the road. So teams would often go on the road for six weeks or more. And these road trips were very cost uh, costly because you, again, were, your only source of revenue was the $75 guarantee for each game you played. Um, but that wasn't enough to cover costs of travel, salaries, expenses, all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, but they, I think St. Paul just joined because they wanted to continue playing ball in the season, not so much because they're trying to make a bit of extra cash. And so as the season comes to a close, uh, St. Louis was the easy pennant winner. They finished with a 94 and 19 record, which is still the record for highest winning percentage by a uh, uh, pennant winner. Um, and yeah, they just dominated the league. They uh, beat out Cincinnati by 25 games. Uh, Cincinnati finished with the 69 and 36 record, but in early August, they had signed Jim McCormick and Jack Glasscock from the National League's uh, Cleveland club. And by the end of the season, they were likely on par with St. Louis in terms of quality. Um, they, they finished really strong. Uh, Milwaukee was also really good. Uh, they went eight and four in their 12 Union Association games. They drew really well and they pioneered a strong three-man rotation, uh, which was clear, unprecedented for the time. So they had three excellent pitchers uh, who so alternated starts. Um, the best of them was probably Ed Cushman, who in his first start in the Union Association, he pitched a no-hitter. And then in his second start, he pitched uh, eight no-hit innings and then allowed a hit in the, the top of the ninth. And so uh, he almost did the back-to-back no-hitter thing uh, about 50 years before Johnny Vandermeer did. And then Baltimore and Boston also finished about 500 on the season. But despite this, despite some modest successes, um, the Union Association, as we know, did not take the field in 1885. Uh, this is despite the fact that there was real discussions about it taking the field. Uh, 
a bunch of the league's Eastern clubs withdrew from the league. And so the plans went forward to do a fully Western version of the Union Association, where you'd have clubs in Cleveland and Toledo, and um, as well as St. Louis and Cincinnati and various other cities. But it all, they'd ignore the East Coast and go entirely sort of Western, uh, so to speak. Uh, and plans were in the works well into January 1885, but at this point, a league president and St. Louis owner, uh, Henry Lucas, um, who was the league's bankroll and its defining figure, he made an agreement with the National League to move his club to uh, move his club over to the National League. And this basically killed off the Union Association because it was no longer the big money man and uh, driving force to keep it going. Um, but that wasn't the end of the Union Association in a sense, because St. Louis joined the National League, um, Washington ended up joining the Eastern League and won the pennant in 1885. Uh, Kansas City and Milwaukee both joined the Western League, which was the new league that kind of formed out of the ashes of the Union Association. And so in 1885, you had four, you know, former Union Association clubs take the field uh, for that for 1885 season. Um, and St. Louis is in the National League, and they were joined in 1886 by Washington and Kansas City, who both joined as well. And so as a result, in 1886, you had three former Union Association alumni clubs in the National League. Um, not surprisingly, they finished sixth, seventh, and eighth. So, I mean, quality is still a bit of a concern there. And uh, here's a nice photo of the 1886 St. Louis uh, Unions. Um, notice they have a black diamond on their chest. They were sort of called the St. Louis Black Diamonds at that point, because they had so many players who'd been blacklisted, uh, either for jumping contracts for various other reasons. And so, the, yeah, the, the uniforms were designed to reflect that. Here's a photo of the 1886 Kansas City Cowboys. Uh, and yeah, again, they were uh, not a strong club, but very nice uniforms, I think. And here's 1888, here's the Washington, uh, uh, Washington Nationals at this point. So uh, both, um, so St. Louis after 1886 moved to Indianapolis and then Indianapolis sort of folded and was merged into the New York Giants in 1890. And uh, both, uh, both the Nationals and the Kansas City Cowboys were sort of defunct after 1889. And so that sort of is like the, the real death of the Union Association is sort of like, 1889 is when the, the final kind of club with any sort of connection to the Union Association took the field. And so that brings me to the final kind of question um, that I get asked very frequently uh, in these presentations I've been doing uh, is, is the Union Association Major League? And I think statistically, uh, it's probably the weakest Major League, say for the early season of the National Association. There's a really excellent Bill James essay where he sort of deconstructs uh, and and is very critical of the Union Association status as a major league. And it's a very strong essay, very well written, very well thought out. Um, and it's certainly worth considering on a statistical level that it, yeah, it has very dubious quality as a major league on that level. Um, but then I think there's a bigger picture here to look at than just stats. It's not all just stats. Um, and so, the first thing we can look at is what is the legacy of the Union Association? I mean, it doesn't have a real strong definitive legacy. It gave us Kansas City's first major league team, St. Louis's first pennant, pennant winner. And it was really the first step in the fight for player freedom uh, in that battle between players and owners that sort of would culminate in, you know, nearly 100 years of, of bitterness uh, until, you know, essentially the reserve clause is finally over finally removed uh, with the Kurt Flood case in 1970. And so, I mean, the Union Association was kind of the first step in that battle. Um, but I think most importantly in talking about the Union Association, we need to look at the context. Um, essentially, the Union Association, I think, is a major league because if you see what organized baseball did to the Union Association, they saw it as an issue. They did their best to undermine and kill it. And the minute they could get Harry Lucas on board and jump ship, they did so. And they you know, essentially really did not want to be in existence. And so if if it's not a major league, why would they care so much? And so those are, these are interesting things to consider. And then there's the historical tradition of just how the league's been perceived um, by baseball researchers uh, for, you know, over a century. Uh, you, you can start with Al Spink, who uh, founded the Sporting News, and he was a St. Louis native, and he later claimed to have worked for Lucas uh, during the ATA4 season. Um, but he wrote one of the first histories of baseball in 1910. It's called The National Game. And in that book, he includes um, like quite a bit of content about the Union Association, about the St. Louis unions, includes photos of the club. He treats it as an equal to the other major leagues. And so 
his influence so starts there in 1910. And one of his disciples was Ernest Lanigan, who was a very influential statistician and baseball researcher as well. He's credited with inventing the, the OBI as a statistic. Um, and he was a disciple of Spink. And he uh, essentially became, uh, in 1922, he wrote baseball's first encyclopedia called the Baseball Cyclopedia. Uh, and that book also sort of gives equal credit to the Union Association as a major league uh, on par with previous major leagues like the Players League and the American Association. And he also became the historian at the Baseball Hall of Fame. And there he mentored Lee Allen, who soon became the baseball historian at the Hall of Fame. And he was instrumental in the creation of the McMillan Encyclopedia in 1969, which sort of standardized baseball statistics baseball's history um, into one thing. And it's the book that sort of codifies what is a major league and what isn't a major league. And in that book, uh, the Union Association is listed as a major league. And uh, so you sort of have this tradition of dating back to 1910 and be beyond where the league is treated as a major league. So I just see no reason to, to change course in 2023. So um, with that, uh, here's my book. It uh, just came out uh, in October. Uh, I found out last week, again, um, as Joe mentioned, that I was the recipient of the 2023 Sabre Baseball Research Awards. Quite quite proud of that. Um, it's a good book. Uh, it's available wherever books are sold. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, I'm happy to answer them after this is done. And also, I'm active online on Twitter and uh, via email. So feel free to get in touch if you want to know more about the Union Association. So thank you for having me. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. Anybody have any questions for Justin? That's so, uh, all right. All right, uh, Mike. And then, okay. Go ahead, Mike. Wow. I, I, I saw a hoy there uh, in the front row of one of those pictures. Was that Germany hoy that made the went out in the Hall of Fame the depth catcher? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, uh, Dummy Hoy uh, would be in the 1888 photo of the Washington Nationals. Yeah, so he was one of the first uh, deaf mute players to succeed in the major leagues and had a very nice career and, yeah, has a pretty reasonable Hall of Fame case, I think. Two questions. One, Jerry Motors, you know, New York teams in the league, and then I assume all the games were played during daytime because there was no lights and... <laughs> They traveled by railroad back and yep. forth. Yeah, so the, yeah, it's a, there's no New York teams. Um, that that comes about because there was a guy. Um, one of the early organizers of the league was a guy called Joseph Jackson, and he was, oh, sorry, James Jackson. My apologies. And he, uh, kind of promised that he could get a team in New York, and he claimed that he had talked to the the owner of the Brooklyn club, which is now the Brooklyn, the Dodgers franchise, to move to the Union Association. He said he had, it was a done deal, and then the the owner refuted him, and then this guy kind of got booted out of, kind of just, just go away. We don't trust you. So, um, yeah, so they, they were looking to put a team in New York, but it just didn't work out because there just wasn't any, you know. Gain ownership on board was a challenge. Um, on the second front, uh, uh, yeah, the the games were daytime games uh, exclusively. A few of the cities played Sunday baseball, um, but some didn't. It, you, a lot of the eastern club eastern clubs did not play Sunday ball, and the western clubs did. Uh, so that was the thing. And train travel, yeah, was a huge ordeal. Um, teams would often go on the road for six weeks or more. And the big reason why Kansas City had trouble establishing itself as like a Major League uh, uh, City was because it was 12 hours train ride from St. Louis to Kansas City going west. And so it was just so far out of the way that it was just very difficult uh, for teams to justify the expense. And at this point in baseball, that's like people are still trying to figure out how to make money at baseball and travel is a big issue. And so the National League for the big chunk of its early existence is much more focused on trying to put teams in cities to make the train travel easier than like what's the best market available. So from 18... 77 to 1883, New York and Philadelphia don't have clubs in, in the National League. And so it's kind of like a, it's a whole thing. Like they, they put teams in Worcester and, and Troy and different places, but kept it out of the East. And so, yeah, that was how they thought about it. One follow-up, show yes. the record of the team. Did they just play a regular season without playoffs or was there a playoff for a champion? 
Yeah, there's no playoff. Um, St. Louis and Cincinnati played uh, an exhibition series, like um, home and home series, so late in the season to like as exhibition games to see who's like the best, and they split those games, and then the the deciding game got laid out, and then uh, both Cincinnati and St. Louis played games in October against Louisville, um, who had finished, I think. Uh, third place in the American Association, but was one of the best clubs in like they only missed, lost pet by a couple games and they split those games as well. And so it was like, yeah, there, and there was no such thing as like this 1840 was the first World Series um, between uh, Providence and uh, the New York um, Metropolitans of the American Association. Uh, this is also the year of old Hoss Radboard, if you know him, who won 59 games that year. Um, and yeah, he he actually won three three more games in the World Series. He just dominated. It was like one of the best pitching seasons ever. And yeah, so he he's Providence won the first World Series that year. But the Youth Association was not part of organized baseball, so they didn't have involvement in that. And the exhibition games with Louisville were kind of done, kind of like to get around the rules. They said it's the players are no longer under contract, so they can play games against the Youth Association. Also, uh, you made no mention of the Western Association. Troy Tigers came from the Western Association, right? Pardon me? Troy Tigers came from the Western Association. Detroit, uh, that's later on. Uh, so the Union Association's 1884. The, the, the Western, essentially the Western League sort of starts... <laughs> The first version of it is 1885, and then there's different variations of it. And then by the 1880s, like 1888, 89, that's when the Western Association comes about. And then that turns into the American League eventually by 1901. All right. What kind of ballpark did they play in? And did they have trouble finding a ballpark to uh, play their game? I, it depended. Um, so like in the case of Boston, Boston joined the Union Association on March 17th and they played their first home game on April 30th. And they had six weeks to build a stadium and they did. And it was supposedly a pretty good, good ballpark, like built stands, had like a cycling track around it and everything. Um, the St. Louis club, they spent a lot of money on their park because they wanted to rival kind of like what Chris Fodera was doing in St. Louis for the Brown Stockings, where it's sort of making almost like a multi-meet, uh, multifaceted entertainment center. Um, so St. Louis did that. Um, in the case of Cincinnati, the Cincinnati owner, he had helped found the Cincinnati Red Stockings in 1882, uh, and he got booted out of the club over a dispute over money. And then he he formed the Union Club as out of spite, and he stole the ballpark out of from under the Cincinnati Reds, like to you know take the rights to that. Um, but yeah, just very dependent. But yeah, like. Every every city had a park that they played in, uh, and some were better than others, depended on on things. You know, but they were all like generally the the capacity for most places was I think like St. Louis Park could hold over ten thousand fans, you know, like that sort of thing. But it wasn't, you know, still like wood wood stands and all that sort of stuff. Was anybody from this league the Canadian yeah, so Tommy McCarthy is the only guy who's in the Hall of Fame as a player. Um, he, he, this is his rookie year, and he was probably the worst player in the Union Association, oddly enough. Uh, he had a terrible year as a hitter, was bad defensively in center field, and also pitched eight games and was awful. And yet he eventually turned into a major league star in the 1880s and early 1890s with the Boston Bean Eaters. He's part of the Heavenly Twins. So he's the only guy who made the Hall of Fame. Um, both Jim McCormick and Jack Glasscock should be in the Hall of Fame, I think. They're both two excellent candidates, um, really great 19th century players. And then George Wright, who um, was on the 1869 Cincinnati Brown Stockings and Cincinnati Red Stockings, basically baseball's first superstar, he was one of the owners of the Boston Club. So there was a bit of involvement with that as well. Pardon me? Yeah, there's there's a few no hitters in the league. Um, so yeah, Ed Cushman pitched one. Um, Hugh Daly pitched. I think he pitched one, but he he also struck out 19 batters in the game, which was a record. He actually struck out 20, but a dropped ball meant that like that strikeout didn't count according to the 1884 rules. Um, and then a guy called Charlie Gagas pitched a no hitter and struck out 13 batters or something. And then uh, Dick Burns, a pitcher for Cincinnati, he pitched a no hitter as well. So there's, I think, four no hitters in the league. And then there's um, St. Louis pitched a five inning no hitter late in the season as well um, in a game they lost. 
Hey, Justin, I had a question for you. In the preface of your book, you and you talked about it a little bit in the presentation. Yes. What is a major league? Yeah. And I remember in the preface, you talked about how the Union Association and what baseball is doing in 1968, 69, and uh, trying to figure out what leagues are uh, actually major leagues, what leagues are not yes. major leagues. And then the next paragraph, you talk about how all this relates to what they did in 2020 with the Negro yeah. Leagues. So can yeah. you talk about that a little bit and why this story is important? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So I think for a while, um, there's a lot of discussion about the Union Association and what it's like credentials as a major league. And um, the issue with that is that it's like, well, it's a weak major league. And then how can that be a major league? But like the Negro Leagues don't have this official recognition when it's clear the Negro Leagues were much stronger, all that sort of stuff. And so as of 2020 with the Negro Leagues or major leagues and like the seven major league, seven Negro Leagues obtaining major league status, I think that sort of answers that question. I think it's it just makes baseball history retro and gives it more context. And it I think inspires more people to dig deeper and find these stories and things like that. Um so I that's I was very happy when that came about because yeah it's 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 a bit problematic to talk about the Union Association as major league and it's like deserved status as such without you know having that other piece of history as well. And so I'm very thankful that that right has been wrong to some extent in some respect, and so I'm, I'm excited where that goes as well, so. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. Regarding the players during that era, were there African-American or American Indian players in the league? Uh, yeah, so there was no, uh, no uh, American Indian players in 1840, uh, but this is also the year Moses Fleetwood Walker broke the color barrier in the American Association. Um, he had been the catcher for the champion Toledo Club, which uh, won the pennant in the Northwestern League in 1883, and then that club moved to the American Association. And so Fleet Walker, as the catcher, he broke the color barrier, and his younger brother Welday also appeared um, for for Toledo that year as well. So those two players broke the major league color barrier like officially um, in 1884. And so, yeah, there was there were some black minor league players as well, um, and but there wasn't really any American Indian players. There, there was a couple players with, I guess, uh, uh, Indian ancestry, so to speak, uh, who'd played in the National Association, but uh, you, there wasn't a lot of that. Um, so at that point in time, but the, there was a few black players along with, yeah, Walker um, and his brother who played for Toledo. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Fascinating stuff, Justin. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's been my pleasure. So thank you so much. We don't, we don't get we don't we don't talk a lot about 19th century baseball too much, but uh maybe we ought to. <laughs> sure. So um we we uh did a as a, a chapter, uh I guess over a decade ago, we we did a um did a project where we talk about Houston baseball and our mm. origins date all the way back to the 1860s. So uh, fascinating stuff. All right. So all right. thanks a lot, Justin. All right. Thank you. Well, I'll log off, but it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Right. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. thanks. Vincent, are you there? Vincent. The Brewers honor Vincent. Testing. Testing. Vincent, I can't hear you. Well, um, while Vincent tries to figure out his uh internet. Oh, are you there? Hey, Joe, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. I couldn't hear you. Okay. Uh, the other you I think do, I was do you want to read your questions? Because I made a PowerPoint. We're gonna have a trivia contest now. Um, <laughs> Vincent emailed me his trivia questions. So um, if you want to answer these, we're gonna y'all gonna have to find a piece of paper or something. <laughs> and he's got the fascinating questions because the topic this month is baseball and the movies. Fascinating topic. So um, I'll try to find some paper. Well, hey, you know, what am I supposed to do, Mike? <laughs> well, write the answers on your phones on the notepad. Maybe you'll win that way. <laughs> All right. Uh, Vincent, you want to read these? Can you see them? Wait, wait, you might, might want to go back. 
Go, go ahead, Joe. I think we're having some audio issues. Just go ahead. It looks like uh, you've got a, a great screenshot and a presentation that I could never put together. <laughs> okay, but uh, do you want to um, read the answers? I mean, I'll read the questions. I don't know. Yeah, that's 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 fine. Go for it. That, that's that's okay. totally fine. All right, we'll work it out. Um, read the questions before the answers. I will read the questions before the answers. So, <laughs> what do you want? Thanks, Mike. Second. Third, is it? Yeah, yeah just do it like that. Just okay. do it like that. Second, first. Question number one. And by the way, the winner tonight gets your own. You know how the Astros have the gold collection? I have a Astros gold pin. Wow. And the winner gets that. I know, I know, I know. I'm a big spender. <laughs> um, so, question number one: Baseball in the movies. Kevin Costner has starred in three baseball movies throughout his career. Name them. One point for each. Kevin Costner has starred in three baseball movies throughout his career. One point for each of them. I'll give y'all a minute to answer. Relatively simple question. Yeah. Yeah. That was not one of the harder ones for sure. <laughs> <laughs> they get harder, I promise. They get harder. Tony promise. That question occurred. That is question one. Well, three possible answers. So one A, one B, one C. There you go. Do you have to get a bit harder? No, Only you. No order. Only you. <laughs> Question number two. IMDB, which is the Internet Movie Database, in case you don't know what that is, uh, gives Babe Ruth screen credits for appearing in 10 movies, many of those shorts during his lifetime. One point for each you can name. Babe Ruth, 10 movies. A lot of them short films. One point for each. Wow. That's a little more difficult. <laughs> yeah. Trying to stop Mike. That was sort of my goal in putting these together. Can I give you a hint? Do you mind, Vince, if I give him a hint for one of them? Nope, not at all. One of them, he dresses up as a woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. One of them, he dresses up as a woman. It's not Mrs. Doubtfire or Tootsie. It is not Mrs. Scoutfire. <laughs> it's not Tootsie either. That's right. <laughs> Babe Ruth screen credits, 10 movies, most of them shorts during his lifetime. One point for each you can name. Turner Classic Movies uh, had one of these movies on just about a week ago. It's not the one you're probably thinking of. Question three. Mike evidently has a problem. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Question three. <laughs> what is the name of the movie and the main character? In the 1970 cult classic starring Bud Court and taking <laughs> place in the Astrodome. This is a good one. What is the name of the movie and the main character in the 1970 cult <clears throat> classic starring Bud Court and taking place in the Astrodome? Did you know this one, Joe? No. <laughs> I did not. You should. <laughs> I should, you're right. I should, but I don't know. This Lena's one. chiming in. What's that? Lena's chiming in behind me. She says that you should know. Oh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. But I wasn't born to 71, so. Fair enough. <laughs> on, number four. Or you want to keep thinking? Number four. Ironic. Vince with the Milwaukee Brewers question. Here we go. Hey, 
with former Milwaukee Brewers pitcher, became a movie producer, producing over 17 movies. He worked, or this person worked with Disney and later became head of his own studio following his baseball career. I will also say as a clue, um, at least two or three of those 17 movies were baseball movies that you probably have heard of or watched. Two or three of these movies, what? Were baseball movies that you probably have heard of or watched. Okay. Which former Milwaukee Brewers pitcher became a movie producer, worked with Disney, and later became head of his own studio following his baseball career? John, you, you always did this. Yeah, I know, but I don't know this. <laughs> that one, the one from that. <laughs> Bet you've done something that many people have not done. You stumped John. Good. <laughs> Still the baseball perspective. Not in there. Okay. Good thing. What is the name of the Texan native and former Tampa Bay Rays pitcher who was the feature of the movie The Rookie? This is easy. <laughs> Disney movie, right? The rookie. Yep. Yep. Uh, I'll give you another hint. The the previous answer actually helped to produce this movie. There you go. Previous answer helped him produce this movie. What is the name of the Texan native and former Tampa Bay Rays pitcher who was the feature of the movie? The rookie. Yeah. I believe he's also a University of Houston graduate. Mm. Yeah. His son went on to be with Sixth inning. Which big league ballpark was the movie Major League filmed in? A little side note, for, side note for you. I don't know what one of your baseball traditions are, but one of my baseball traditions is every year, the week of opening opening day weeks, I always watch Major League. I love that. This is the bird. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> it. That movie is so funny. <laughs> I know, I just, I love this stuff. Which big league ballpark was the movie Major League film been? Next. The 1994 movie Little Big League saw 19 Major League players, past or then current, appear in the movie. One point for each that you can name. <laughs> Babe Ruth is probably not an answer. <laughs> this is the ghost of Babe Ruth. <laughs> didn't, didn't he wear a dress in that one? What's that? He didn't wear a dress in Little Big League? No, he didn't wear a dress in Little Big League. <laughs> <laughs> 1994 movie Little Big League saw 19 MLB players pass then current. Up here in the movie, one point for each. 19. That's a lot of answers. Zero is a score. John, I can't believe this. <laughs> Somebody's going to have to go. Oh, yeah, we are recording this. Somebody's got to win this thing. We got to remember this with posterity. John stumps. <laughs> <laughs> Little Bigly? Oh, come on. No, no. This ain't that old. <laughs> <laughs> or he ain't that young. Sorry. I don't know, Ben. How old are you, Ben? I'm younger than you, Joe. I got at least a decade younger than you. <laughs> you were born in 71? Yeah. 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 All right. Anybody still writing the 19 names? 15 more? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Eighth inning. Which book was the 1989 movie Filled of Dreams, Jimmy, based on? 
Which book was the 1989 movie filled with dreams made by? Oh, John, you got to know this. You got to get some culture in that tree. <laughs> I know it's cornfield. Water <laughs> corn. <laughs> Chris says the movie's better than the book. Well, there you go. Have you seen the movie at least, Jack? I've seen it. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Her hasn't seen. There is somebody in this room that hasn't seen Filled with Dreams. Come on. Her has not seen Filled with Dreams. All right, that is your job. <laughs> we have an additional speaker for June. Herb <laughs> is giving a movie review to the trench. <laughs> By the way, Bailey Hall has confirmed that she will be our speaker in June. She emailed me back during the presentation. So be here June 12th for that great presentation. Those of you who may like analytics, and those of you who don't like, you will like Bailey Hall's presentation. And after that, we get a movie review from her. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. In the movie, The Natural, based on the book by Bernard Malmood, right? The name right yep. Which former MLB player's story did Malmood use as a template for the Roy Hobbs character played by Robert Redford? This is easy. Over here. I'm on. Have you seen the natural herd? <laughs> yeah, bonus. Which former MLB player's story did Malmut use as a template for the Roy Hobbs character played by Robert Jensen? <laughs> Extra inning bonus. Which former American League Cy Young award winner appeared as the Yankee slugging first baseman Clue Haywood, who Bob Euchre describes as leading the league in offense categories, including nose hair, in the movie Major League, I believe Bob Eager also said this guy hit his own kid in a father stun <laughs> pitching <laughs> game or something like that. <laughs> Is that right? Did I get that right? <laughs> Close yeah. enough. Yeah, when he sneezes, he looks like a party favor. He <laughs> looks like a party favor. Uh -huh. Which former American League Cy Young Award winner appeared as the Yankee slugging first baseman Clue Haywood? Bob Eager describes as leading the league in offensive categories, including nose hair in major league. That's the last question. Yep, yep that was extra innings, 10 total. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Very good. Answers. Sure. You want to go back to the questions? Yep. Okay. Question one. Kevin Coster, three movies. Bull Durham. Field of Dreams. For the love of the game. Announced yep. by who? The whole movie? The game was announced by who? The whole movie. For the love of the game. Doctor's guy. Vince Scully, right? Vince Scully. Vince Scully. Yeah. You want to watch Vince Scully do what he does best in a Hollywood form? Watch for the love of the game. You almost cry at the end. Vince Scully is that good. Well, wow, that's clear. For the love of the game. Great, great film. Right? Number two. Babe Ruth, screen credits. Pride of the Yankees. Everybody probably got that. Yeah. Home run on the keys. Just Pals, Perfect Control, Over the Fence, <clears throat> Babe Ruth dresses up as a woman in Fancy Curves. Okay. <laughs> Fancy Curves. Watch it. It's on YouTube. It's about nine minutes long. It's just yep. funny. <laughs> slide, baby, slide. 
Turner Classic Movies played Speedy about a week and a half ago. Yep. Never seen Babe Comes Home and Heading Home. John answered all of those right. <laughs> oh, <he's laughs> <a cowboy. laughs> One, two, three, four, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Pride of the Yankees, home run on the keys, just pals, perfect control, over the fence, faint control. Okay. Fancy curves, slide babe, slide babe, slide, speedy, babe comes home, heading home. Ten. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> Number three, uh, Buck Court, 1970 cult classic, Astrodome. You know got it? Yeah. Brewster McLeod. Yeah. <laughs> Brewster, anybody seen Brewster McLeod? Did anyone get that? Did who? Did anyone get that one? Yeah, a couple people. A couple okay, people. good, good, good. Okay. <laughs> Number four. Uh, you're going to have to help me if I destroy this name. You want to say the name, Vince? Uh, the name is Mark Chiardi. Mark Chiardi. Which former Milwaukee Brewer pitcher became a mover, movie producer? Mark Chiardi. Yeah, he, he just had a cup of coffee in Milwaukee, but he played, I think, over parts of two seasons in 87-88. Uh, C-I-A-R-D-I. Mark Chiardi. Yep. Moving on, number five, our fifth inning. Here we go. Name of the Texans native and former Tampa Bay Rays pitcher who was the feature of the movie The Rookie. Jim Morris. I thought it was Dennis Clay. I thought it was asking the name of the actor. <laughs> Yeah, we got you there. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta be careful here. <laughs> Jim Morris. <laughs> Trick me out too. Wow. All right. Anyway. Number six. Number six. Which big league park was the movie Major League filmed in? Anybody know? John got one right. Milwaukee County Stadium. County Stadium. Yep. <laughs> uh, can, anybody, can anybody tell me uh, the spring training facility name Vince has here for bonus points for that movie, the spring training facility of the Indians? What is the name of that field? Go ahead and take a guess for bonus points. Give up? Okay. High Corbett Field. All right. All right. And that field was not part of Charlie Sheen's recent minor league California peak. <laughs> For seven, uh, 1994 Little Big League, 19 MLB players. Here we go. Leon Durham, Kevin Elster, Brad Leslie, Griffey Jr., Lou Pinella, Mickey Tettleton, Pudge Rodriguez, Ivan Rodriguez, Sandy Alamore Jr., Eric Anthony, Carlos Bayarga, Alex Fernandez, Randy Johnson, Wally Joyner, Dave, Mad Dave Magadan, Lenny Webster, Paul O'Neill, Rafael Palmero, never used steroids, <laughs> Dean Palmer, and Tim Ranks. Yeah, 
Yeah. That's the 19 major yeah. leaguer. Number eight. Surprised you didn't get this, one, John. Maybe you did. Number eight. Which book was Field of Dreams based on? What was the name of the book? W. P. Kinsella wrote the book. Shoeless Joe. Shoeless Joe. Shoeless Joe. In the book, you don't see Shoeless Joe. There's a view that just goes to the images and not. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. the movie. It's the movie's a lot better. Yeah. The film the the nice. Thing. Yeah. Number nine, The Natural. Bernard. Madden. Which former MLB player story did Mallet use as a template for the Roy Hobbs character? Um, Eddie Whitecus. Eddie Whitecus, formerly of the Chicago Cubs, Phillies, and Orioles. Played 1941 and 46 to 1950 something. Long time. Long time. Um, hey, uh, Vince, you're going to have to tell him the answer to the bonus because I don't have that for some reason. Yeah, I, I forgot. I sent it to you in a separate email, but uh, the, do you want to read the, you read the question again, Joe, and I'll give the answer? Which former American League Cy Young Award winner appeared as the Yankee slug first baseman? Slugging first baseman, Lou Haywood, Bob Euchre, nose hair, yep. major league. Uh, 1981 Sang Award winner, Pete Bukovic. Pete Bukovic. Yep. That's How many points is that overall? I, I wasn't a math major. I, I was a history guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you wrote the quit. <laughs> I, we'd have to add them up. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You want to add it up real fast? Yeah, hold on. Oh, hold on. Let me, uh, hold on. Hold on, Vince. I got, I got you. Uh, three, 13, and... 14, 15, 16, 17, 36, 37, 38, 39. Does that sound right? Yep, that looks right. 39 and possible answers. Who got 10? Wow. 39 possible answers. Nobody got 10. Who <laughs> <laughs> got five? <laughs> Who got seven? Oh, 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 oh. John, get wow! Can't hold him back. Not, not very hey, Patrick. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. He had all the answers. Okay. <laughs> no, he did because I don't think he was. Yeah, I got uh, six points and two bucks and seven. Anybody? Uh, anybody on Zoom? Answer any of You want to stop sharing? Yeah. Who we got left on Zoom? Just hit stop share. Uh, anybody get more than eight? Nine. Hey. Congratulations, Patrick. You're. You get to win two prizes this month. The first prize is this cup. Gold Astro spin that I got for about six, seven months <laughs> uh, from Fanatics. And you get to write the trivia question, the trivia contest for June. Okay? Do not forget, June. All right? Thank you all very much. Um, don't forget, we're not having a meeting in May. Uh, we, we will have a pre-game meeting in uh, Sugarland. Uh, more details will follow as soon as I get them from Mike. We're going to work on a speaker. June 12th, that is the second Monday of June. June 12th, Bailey Hall will be here to present. You don't want to forget about that. Yes, she's actually coming. Okay. Um, and Herb has given us a movie review on Field of Dreams. That'll be just for Herb. And Patrick's giving us a tribute contest. 
Go Astros. See you next month. Thank you.